Well, let's talk about test trace, shall we? Um, so first, some audience participation. Uh, who knows what trace is? Okay, uh, almost everyone. And who uses it regularly? Okay, almost half. And who has had some issues with its performance? Okay, so yeah, there are still some people, so probably <laughs> those are who are genuinely interested in this talk. Anyway, S-Trace is, a, as you all know, is a Cisco tracer, and uh, this talk is focuses in uh, one particular bit in its main page that well, a trace process is running so slowly, and it's considered a bug. But uh, in fact, it's uh, a part of the way S-Trace works. Specifically, uh, S-Trace uh, uses uh, P-Trace uh, debugging subsystem for tracing. And P-Trace actually is a generic uh, debugging interface uh, which provides a set of commands for like uh, manipulating traces. And uh, well, among these commands, requests are like reading and writing uh, traces memory, uh, reading and writing registers, etc. And uh, almost all of these operations are performed on the stopped processes. And uh, another part of the trace uh, API, which is kind of peculiar, is the fact that, well, it abuses the standard uh, uh, Unix uh, signer link interface, uh, specifically WaitPit, in order to deliver like uh, notifications about uh, traces event. And, uh, uh, for, for this, uh, oh, it is used for all kinds of events, like uh, st standard stops, well, which are issued after like Petrace continue or uh, Petrace single step or Petrace Cisco requests or like uh, some signals that uh, the trace has received and so on. And uh, what s -Race does, well, it just uh, sits in a loop uh, in waiting in wait for and upon receiving uh, a uh, signal from a child, it tries to figure out for what child it was and for what event happened. Uh, so then it uh, actually reads uh, the information from the tracy. Usually it's registered, but uh, sometimes, depending on the architecture, it's also memory. And then it can figure out what well, the Cisco is and well, what its arguments are. And then, uh, based on the Cisco number, the specific decoder is executed. Then, well, additionally, it performs some additional memory reads in order to like, properly decode the Cisco and present it to the user. So, when the dec decoding is finished, well, the trace is resumed. And this, like, uh, stops and resume, uh, resumes happen like twice for each Cisco, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so, well, uh, assuming that well, little can be done about the uh, way S3 is work itself, we can try to at least uh, optimize well the, the way it does what it does. And actually, there is some room for optimization. Uh, specifically, like, uh, depending on the architecture, there are like, different ways to obtain the register data, for example. Historically, it was Ptrace PQ request, which allows reading uh, uh, by word by word from like, specific, uh, oh, specifically designated uh, addresses, uh, which represented uh, traces registers, but uh, later for uh, some architectures that appeared later in the Linux kernel, new uh, interfaces uh, have been implemented, which then have been backported to the well, old, older architectures, such as x86, and so by enabling these interfaces, actually, uh, we can, we could speed up uh, the as traces operation uh, well, to some extent. Uh, but yeah, it happened quite a while ago. ago like uh, for x86, uh, the uh, 
Petrejs Gjotret kset në ebo moment o zdane në të sazën së cinë by Dinis Vajsenka. And well, instead of uh, issuing a multitude of uh, Petrejs operations, uh, it is to only one. It is not uh, all that rosy for like some other architectures, for example, uh, for 32-bit uh, x86 architecture, you still have to read memory, and for MIPS, you have, still have to read memory, and for IA64, for Dynium, you still have to read memory in order to obtain uh, the register, because well, for Dynium, it's uh, stored in registry files that is, well, uh, basically a region in memory. But for most architectures, well, it has been reduced to a single Cisco for like, obtaining registers on Cisco entry. Uh, the next thing is just, well, do not issue some, well, bitrace requests that are not needed. For example, uh, you don't need uh, to get uh, Cisco number on exiting. Assuming, well, the, you have, you are doing uh, your uh, traces state uh, tra tracking correctly, which is another issue that well, has been solved by Petrace Cisco info uh, request that well, it reports also whether uh, you enter the Cisco or exit. Otherwise, you can't well, distinguish the, these two states uh, reliably. And well, it's a source of like several bugs uh, throughout this history. Like, you have, for example, an assumption that well, after exec you are in trace. Uh, oh, the first uh, trace stop after, uh, for example, exec v is uh, uh, Cisco existing, but it's not always the case, and not uh, for all architectures. And well, we have hit uh, such uh, bugs uh, well, several times, and well, we still couldn't solve them reliably without well implementing Petrace Cisco info. Um, the same goes for like filtered processes. Well, when we know that, well, we are not interested in a specific Cisco, that we well, do not need to issue any Petrace request uh, on its exiting at all. We just well, have to resume it and that's it. Um, the next thing is uh, well, various optimization specific to like specific Petrace modes. Well, as a leftover or uh, after like uh, get rex set an element, uh, uh, separate Petrace pick user request for EIP register has been left over and then well, it was patched. Um, so uh, after we have obtained the registers, uh, the, we need to like actually read data from tapes. And again, uh, historically, it uh, has been done via Petrace big data interface, which uh, allows you reading uh, traces memory word by word, which is not very quick when, if you want like to read some large structure or like some array or like things like that. But uh, in uh, Linux uh, 3.2, a new set of Cisco was implemented, specifically process VM read V and process write V. It was originally designed for like uh, applications like uh, MPI-based uh, uh, message passing interface-based uh, applications when you have like several MPI uh, processes running on the same node, uh, you can avoid double copying of memory via like shared memory or via pipe by like using this specific uh, Cisco that allows you copy uh, messages directly between process. But well, it was also useful for S3 as it allows like issuing a single uh, Cisco for reading all the data it needs, well, at least for specific data region. But um, uh, it still was a bit cumbersome since uh, like we have uh, separate uh, move calls for like each uh, uh, array item and so on. So later, uh, like six years later, Dmitry implemented uh, caching for this uh, calls that well, performs reading for, of the whole page of a single process uh, read, VM read vehicle 
and well, that uh, allowed speeding up uh, array pacing consider considerably. Um, another thing that was done is like some general optimizations. For example, uh, it was usually assumed that, well, you don't have like a lot of processes to trace and, well, there was a simple algorithm implemented for uh, matching uh, PID to like tracy control block, like tra tracy description structure. Uh, but when you have a lot of processes, as uh, some did, uh, it well, starts eating significant amount of CPU time and by like implementing a trivial hashing by like using the lowest uh, 10 bits, uh, it was sped up quite significantly like uh, in this artificial uh, example, it was well, five times speed up. But yeah, not uh, all the fixes are the same. And there was uh, actually a bug that was opened by a Red Hat partner that well, some threads stop uh, when a trace with uh, follow forks option is, is executed on multi thread processes. And uh, the issue was, well, the reproducer is quite simple, just, well, you have a uh, main process that uh, runs, uh, uh, well, spawns 10 threads, and each thread, like, starts running a cheap Cisco, like, get to it. And the problem is that, well, after spawning three or four processes, uh, threads, it, well, just stop doing so, and, well, it virtually hangs. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, it was uh, a sh scheduling fairness issue. And, uh, well, you can assume that well, it's a kernel bug and, well, Stress shouldn't care about it, but on the other hand, uh, it's Stress uh, and Stress users who are impacted by this bug. So, uh, the solution well, was proposed to collect uh, the, all the traces stop stops uh, in a batch and then dispatch them. Uh, it was like implemented in a month, like uh, it was available more or less uh, by the end of January in, uh, 2009. But uh, there were some disagreements with the stasis maintainer at the time, it was Ron Magra. And yeah, there was some disagreement with him some specifics of, the, of this patch and of the way it was implemented. So after like initial inclusion, it was re reverted back half a year later and the fix itself became real only. Um, and it was like that like almost 10 years. Uh, there was like one follow-up discussion three year three years later when a time has come to forward port this patch to yet another rel. But yeah, status quo was like, it was carried over in a rel. And uh, that's it. When I became maintainer of s uh, I faced the need of like forward porting it again and decided that I don't want to do that more than once. So I tried to upstream it once, once more and actually it took like more than half a year and uncovered several bugs in s -trace, like more or less like some corner cases, but still uh, we have added like three or four new test cases for these corner cases and yeah, it finally has been included in s 5.0 that was released like in March 2019. Yeah, and so this, patch has some, quite a number of resource lines and co-authored bylines, and I actually noticed that, that I've missed at least several people when I write a document message for it. Um, but it doesn't help much with, uh, well, general slowness of stress. Like, it, uh, this, this removal of redundant betrays uh, requests and uh, using of PS, uh, process VM redware allows like speeding up uh, stress only so slightly, like tens of uh, persons. And uh, well, as 
some may know there is like a famous uh, or infamous post of Brandon Gregg about well, how it races so, like 400 times and so on. And now I'm reciting it or making it more popular. But actually, I couldn't reproduce it. But the, the, the issue is the same. If you have like some process that just spawns uh, traces, then well, your stress becomes the major bottleneck and can uh, slow down the uh, process significantly, like more than 100 times at least. But uh, in the real world, you still have the, uh, such slowdown, but well, not as dramatic. But Still, and you can see uh, that in this example, like uh, all the improvements of stress over the like past ten years, about well, only uh, like gaining curve, like tens of percent of performance. So if we can't well speeding up a stress anymore, we can try to approach the problem from like another edge. And actually, it was approached by security researchers uh, who uncovered several uh, side channel attacks which uh, slowed down uh, Cisco entry code significantly. And as a result, it's now like uh, three to four times slower uh, with uh, all these uh, kernel patches and uh, micro microcode mitigations and uh, Actually, uh, well, there was like quite a fine crafted uh, Cisco entry routine in, for x86, and it's now well, has been thrown out like in 2018 by Andy. So it's no longer the case that well, it is there. Like well, one of aspect of this fine crafted routine was that well, if you have like fast pass, you're not, for example, p traced, then well, you have uh, much better execution time for Cisco. Uh, rather than PTS. So by like having PTS itself uh, slowed down the process significantly. So yeah, like with this fancy side channel mitigation stuff, you now have uh, uh, only uh, like a couple of tens of times of slowdown, which is actually in line what, with what uh, other architecture has. For example, MIPS, uh, ARM, uh, Power, or uh, SP90. So, but still, it's uh, like significant slowdown, a couple of tens of times. And all this because, well, we have to stop Tracy each time for each Cisco. But, well, we don't actually have to do so. There is actually a, uh, another infrastructure in Linux kernel uh, that is called SecComp for secure computing. And it allows enabling some uh, filters for processes, uh, or Cisco filters. Originally, it was like uh, implemented for process sandboxing, but then it was extended. And uh, what is interesting for s -trace is that uh, in Linux uh, 3.5, uh, the SICCOM programs gained uh, an ability to return uh, to uh, ptrace-based tracer by uh, issuing specific uh, like return value. And uh, sometime later, uh, it was actually a result of two JSOC projects, uh, uh, the support for such, uh, for generation of such of filters for traces has been implemented into s -trace, and it was included into s 5.3. So now uh, with uh, this second BPF option, you will slow down uh, Tracy in this well, artificial example only about, by a couple of persons and not like a couple of tens of times. So, which probably a significant improvement. <laughs> um, yeah, and with some like more or less realistic examples, you still like, if you, for example, trace like only. Oh, in this example, I was tracing only memory-related syscalls, and while well, I gained only like one and a half slowdown instead of like two to three times. So that's probably a short history, and yeah, and there's not like a lot to 
of playing for future, like in near future, probably like some refinement of the existing uh, uh, capabilities, but like in distant future, probably some drastic changes are possible, but it mostly related on the addition on specific kernel interfaces first. And only then you can implement it in S3 later. So that's probably it. Any questions? So before we jump to questions, I want to tell you that we have a mic for questions. So just raise your hand and I'll come to you. So, hey, I'm uh, wondering uh, why is not the BPF backend uh, by default yet? What are, what are the problems? Um, no, first we have enabled, enabled it in uh, release 5.3, uh, which uh, has been released uh, less than half a year ago. Um, the issue is that, uh, oh, I pe uh, personally don't feel uh, confident enough in enabling it by default. For example, when you impose a SIG computer on a, progr on a program, then you know, the, the program, the processes down, the code uh, fork chain can't, well, uh, uh, can't set up their own SIG uh, 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 filters and so on. And actually we have uncovered several minor bugs uh, in the late, uh, which were fixed in the later 5.4 release. So we just probably want to wait a bit some time before like enabling it by default, like it was with, for example, Stack Unwinding, which, well, Stack Unwinding is a bad example because it took like almost six years for enabling it by default. But yeah, the issue is that, well, we don't want to regress people and well, when we enable, enable something by default, we want to be sure, we want to be sure that well, it won't regress a lot of people, at least. Uh, I have an alternative answer for this. So, SIGCOM BPF, uh, it has uh, two limitations. Uh, the first one is that you can't do this when attaching to already existing processes. So S trace dash P, you can't do this unless you are privileged. And well, S trace is normally not privileged. Oh, if you are root, you can do all that kind of fancy kernel tracing. And we, when you are just a regular user, you use S trace, and you can't attach a BPL filter to already running process. It's the first issue. The second issue is you once you attached a, a filter, you can detach it. So if you, for example, stop tracing and want the tracer to go on, you can't just detach your filter you installed. Uh, it will convert to a, uh, the filter will work uh, uh, the way that uh, instead of stop, instead of trapping, it will just uh, abort all syscall uh, invocations that had to be uh, forwarded to to tracer, and it's really un unusable. Oh, maybe last question, no? Okay, oh. So, um, assuming you have perf, yes. and uh, an unlimited buffer, or just a way to stop the process <laughs> when your buffer fills up, will it be the ultimate solution, or are there any benefits of uh, um, the current approach, right? Yeah, and actually that's what was proposed by Steven Rostad in this patch. Um, like pausing the uh, tracy upon, well, when, when the buffer fills. But yeah, there is actually another issue like uh, trying to port all the decoders to BPF. Like uh, Perf uh, enables uh, rich uh, Cisco deco decoders by well, uh, having uh, some BPF programs that are attached to trace points and thus well, you can uh, perform retrieval of specific uh, parts of traces memory which are need required by the decoders. And well, it pu puts these parts of traces memory into buffer and then you can well, uh, retrieve it from buffer in order to print it to the user. And uh, it doesn't go 
doesn't go well as it is with currently implemented decoders for S-trace. But yeah, in, th in theory, well, if you well, uh, an approach like this will be enabled, and well, you don't have like uh, other significant issues. Well, it, it is quite possible, and it's actually well the future as it, it is seen in the far distant, <laughs> like because well, uh, BPF programs as well as quite limited as, it, as they are now, and. Not all decoders are, well, uh, well we, we can port uh, that easily. For example, IOCTL. You can't port IOCTL to BPF. Or like uh, some uh, network uh, syscalls we want, we want to decode Netlink. So, but yeah, it's a limitation, but I mean, uh, it's the same as with second BPF. Like, uh, we can uh, like implement it for like most of the syscalls and then, uh, well, <laughs> provide special handling for the rest of it. Yeah. So thank, thank you for your questions.